Okay, this week is Tazriya Mitzayra. Last year we talked about Saras a little bit, about leprosy. When I was preparing, I originally was thinking to do something on the other Tumis. The other, we have the bulk of the, a Pasha and a half talks about Saras, about leprosy. And the second half of Mitzayra, we have Kedi and Zov, and Nida and Zava, which are called Tuma Kala and a Tuma Hamura. Two different. So I was thinking maybe I'll do something on Zava and Zava or things like this, but I had a difficult time finding information. I looked in the Tzamach Tzedek, not a word on Zava and Nida. These things. Nida and Zava had it. On Zava, there's the, the, the different types of tumor that have to do with body omissions. Whether they're natural or they're diseased. If they're natural, they're called Keri and Nida, man and woman respectively. And if they're illnesses, they're called Zava and Zava, man and woman respectively. And there's all kinds of halachas about these tumors. Uh-huh. They're considered a very severe tumor because it's called Tuma Yeti Migufi. There's different types of spiritual impurities. One of the most severe is the Tuma Yeti Migufi, when the tumor comes out of the body itself. But I, I thought better of it because I couldn't find information. I came to Yeshiva tonight and I mentioned to Rabbi Jacobson that I was planning to do Zov and Zov. I couldn't find information. He said, oh, I know a whole bunch of sikhs. So maybe next year. So I changed to Mikvah. Very nice. I switched to Mikvah. Mikvah, as you know, is the basic mechanism for purification from a spiritual impurity. There are exceptional uh, ways of being purified from spiritual impurity. For example, if one has encountered a dead body, they need ash of paraduma, the blood, the ash of the red heifer, to purify them. And a leper, a mitzeda, needs um, the 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 the, sh- the shaving off all of his hair and the spraying of the bird, the, the blood of the bird, and sending it out of the camp and so you forth. Say, uh, say, uh, no, it's a totally different, different tumor. It's, it's a very severe tumor also. A mitzayda is a tumor, a tumor, a tumor midras, which is the most severe kind of a tumor. But, but it's a totally different kind of tumor. A tumor is, it's also called tumor sha'al I believe it says. Nida and zav and zav are yetzi me'gufi. They come from inside the body. It's a very severe tumor. Saras requires for purification <laughs> to, to be isolated, and then when the person is cleared from the tzaras, they have to take two birds and you shecht one of them and you dump the, the, you, you dunk the other bird with some different materials into the blood of the dead bird. You sprinkle it on the dead person. You have to wait seven days and so forth. So there are exceptions. No, it's called the tmei mess. And for this, you have to have the paraduma. The actual the paraduma. Yeah. The rule is, the rule essentially is. That pretty much, if you're a Tommy, you gotta go to mikvah. Sometimes, before you go to mikvah, you gotta do other stuff, like the ashes of paraduma, or the bloods of the taras, and then you go to the mikvah. When a person goes to the mikvah, as a rule, there's only one exception: you go by day, you don't go by night. The only exception is nida. Tafka by day. When a person travels in the mikvah, they're not pure yet. They're called a tvu yoyim. They've titled that day, the setting of the sun makes them pure. Okay, so whatever kind of tumor it is, there's different kinds of tumor. There's a tumor of nevela, of a dead body, or a sheret, uh, touching a reptile or a rodent. Um, the tumor of saras, we have to have other stuff, and paradum, we have to have other stuff, or lesser measures of tumor, like a shenila tumor, a shlishla tumor, you would have to... So sometimes you have to do things before the mikvah, but then you have to go to the mikvah until the nightfall. And then there are occasions where there is something that follows the mikvah, and that's a carbon. This is called a machus al That you you tell the mikvah, you wait for the sun to set, so you're no longer tummy for tvil yoyim. And if you would be a koyin, you'd be allowed to eat truma, but you would not be allowed to go into the base. So the following day, or whenever your opportunity came, you would bring a carbon. And then you become pure to go into the base of Mikdash. If you didn't bring that carbon, you'd be in bad trouble. And there are four Mukhusri Kipurim, there are four Tumas which require not just Mikvah and something before Mikvah, but also the carbon after Mikvah. A Yeldus, a woman who has a baby, a Zav and a Zava, a man or a woman who have an omission from the body which is diseased as opposed to natural, and a Matayna, a leper. 
they have to bring carbonus. So the way I'm articulating it, in other words, is pretty much if you were Tommy, you got to go to mikvah. Sometimes there are things that you do prior to the mikvah. Sometimes there are things that you're going to do subsequent to the mikvah. But you got to go to the mikvah. Mikvah is a central component of Tumen Tahara. So this is the topic we're going to touch on. We're going to talk about mikvah. We're not going to learn the laws of mikvah. We're going to learn Taimeha mikvah. The different reasons for the mikvah. There's a lot of very interesting different reasons that are separate from one another by a hair. Not much of a difference, but interesting different commentaries on mikvah. Of course, Kabbalah and Hasidus always add something really solid to the discourse. But I want to make a preface. And that is this. There's a Gemara. I once heard this pshat from a mashpia of mine. A real mashpia of mine. And I think it's a credible pshat. The Gemara says, hachkim, yasik If you want to be wise, learn business law. If you want to be a smart person, learn business law. It's a Gemara. It's a Gemara of a what is the meaning of this statement? Obviously, business law teaches you street smarts. It teaches you the wisdom of the reality of the world. But this mashpi of mine said something that I consider very, very credible. He said, Torah has different levels. There are things in Torah which are only logical if you believe first. There are things in Torah which are so critically logical or so logical that even if you take faith out of the equation, they'll still make sense. So the Gemara says, the aspect of Torah, the dimension of Torah, which is so logical that you can almost argue this idea without the Torah, is business law. In other words, we have six basic areas of law. Zroim, Moyid, Noshim, Uzik, and Kodeshim, and Tadis. Zroim means the laws of agriculture. Moyid means the laws of time, holidays, Shabbos, Yom Tov, Sabbath. Nashim means the laws of, of marriage and divorce and vows and so forth. Nizika means business law. And of course also liability. The laws of liability and responsibility. Kadashim means laws of karbanis. And Tadis means the laws of pure and impure. These six levels of Taita are all God's wisdom. And they come from heaven to earth. If you will, some have descended further than others. None has descended lower than business law, than Nizika. Business law in Taita is so logical that if you take God out of business law, it doesn't change very much. The truth is it would change, every aspect would change a tiny drop, but only a tiny drop. And the proof is every system of jurisprudence that's current is based heavily on the Talmud. They're not following the Talmud for the laws of hygiene. <laughs> They're not following the Talmud for the laws of of, uh, of spirituality and fineness and separating man from animal to the contrary, looking in the Talmud door, whatever the Talmud says not to do. But business law is completely logical. So the argument is this. Torah is God's wisdom. God gave it to us. God allows us to understand it. Some of it comes down to us. Some of it we need to go to. In other words, some levels of Torah are so logical a human being, as such, simply as a rational human being, says, yeah, this, is, this makes sense, this is true. Other things in Torah, in order to make sense, you have to accept the premise of Hashem, to accept the premise of spirituality, accept the premise of things that are more than material. So if you were to take the six orders of Mishnah and say, okay, put them in order of least to most humanly comprehensible, Alternatively, put them in order of most to least spiritual, which is the highest, which really means the most difficult to comprehend, which is the lowest, which means the most comprehensible, Nezikin would be at the bottom. Kodeshim, Taharis would be someplace near the top. Korbanas would probably be, on the, would be the least comprehensible. But the laws of Taharis, the laws of purity, um, are, are logical. But there's a lot of faith that's the foundation of that logic. In other words, once you accept the premises, the foundations of the notion of pure, and in pure there's so much wisdom, so much logic, so much reason to the whole domain, to the whole realm of tahir, of pure versus impure. So when you learn about mikvah, you say, well, let's give reasons. Why do we go to the mikvah? What's the meaning of mikvah? What's the significance of mikvah? What's the effect of mikvah? Mikvah, you have to establish a premise. 
And the premise is, we want to understand the reason of mikveh with the understanding that this is Abish Tata. And the Abish Tata is the opposite of how we reason. We reason from more human to more spiritual, from more real to less real. Hashem's reason is inverse. Hashem comes from Ein Sof. Hashem comes from a place of infinity and transcendence and gives us His wisdom and it descends from higher to lower. So when you ask, I, I touched a rodent, so I, 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 I can't go to the base. I make the 24 hours. I touched an animal. It was alive, I'm pure. It's dead, I'm impure. I, I shechted an animal. Shechted an animal. Turned out the behemoth was taif, I became tummy. Behemoth kosher, not tummy. What's the difference? Same piece of meat. These kinds of notions are spiritual. The ability to begin to understand them requires an asura mikam l'eskara I must depart from here to go there. The laws of business don't require a departure because they're really grounded. They're in this world. Mikvah is a classic example of the discourse of Tum and Tahara. It's the center of purity. It's the center of of purity, as I illustrated in my first introduction, the wisdom to mikvah is founded on the assumption that we're dealing with God's wisdom. God's wisdom is true, notwithstanding that I can't argue it in the court of law, I can't argue it biologically, I can't argue it physically or, or uh, materially, but I, it, it makes sense on a level of spirit, on a level of soul, on a level of neshama. I think... Did you, did you say a uh, shochet, if you would have um, shecked an animal and it turned out that it wasn't kosher and he handled it, now he's tumma? Yeah. So he has to, like, disengage from... No, he has to do nothing. If he wants to go into the base of Mikdash, he's got to disengage. Oh, but he can continue to shecht on He's the not animals. going into the base of Mikdash. We're all tummy. Gotcha. These laws are relevant under unique circumstances. Now, now, now. How does purity and impurity work? The first thing that's interesting about pure and impure is impurity. Before we get to Tad, let's talk about Tuba. There's a strange phenomenon about impurity. For the event of impurity to exist, you have to be important. Stones cannot be impure. If you made a cup out of stone, cannot be impure. Made a cup out of earth, unless you baked it in an oven and you made it into an earthenware vessel, cannot be impure. Animals can never be impure. They can make you impure. They're not impure. A goy doesn't acquire tumma. The chacham, the mugoy said that every goy, even a ben has a din of a, of a zov, which is a very severe tumma. But this is a rabbinic... Which one is if you touch a goy? Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Go back. The rabbi said that every goy has din of a zov. It's, it's a really offense that the chacham made between yidin and goyim. But a goy, certainly a living goy, cannot conduct Tumma. Only a Yid can conduct Tumma. So when he said you touch a Goy, what? Please touch... Not, today, we don't worry about these Tumas. There's no base on Mikdash. We're all unclean anyway. We all go to cemeteries. There's no Ash of Parad Duma. We're all in a perpetual state of Tumma. The only Tumma we really concern ourselves with is Nida. And those of us who have a connection to Chesidus, to a higher standard, we try to concern ourselves also with a male omission with Keri, what's called Tumas Ezra, Tzvilas Ezra, that if a person needs to, you go to the Mikvah. Why No, Tumas is with Man Ezra, depends which Tumas. The Baal leaders is a Kodis. No, but Aroyas is a Din and Tumas Tara, no? And, you know, you're right. Fine. So, you're therefore, what's the next question? No, no, no. So, the first two and five is not applicable. You, even in times of the base on Mikta, you have no khir to be pure unless you're a kayan. You can walk around and tell me your whole life. Comes Yom Tif. You have to go to the base on Mikta. That's right. You have to make yourself tired. There's no obligation to be pure. Why is this? That there seems to be a gravitation of Tume to Kedusha. And of course, the, the answer is a spiritual one. It's not a biological one. It's a spiritual one. The spiritual answer is that Tumah is a product of the presence of Klippa, of living energy that's negative. And this living energy that's negative is trying to draw from positive energy. Klippa, the evil forces that Hashem created, have very limited lifespans. 
their life expectancy is broadened, but we're imperfect. When we do an Aveda, we're nourishing, we're sustaining Klippas that otherwise have a relatively short life expectancy. So Klippa is constantly trying to find the weakness in the Jew. Just like we understand biologically that every human being, the other human being is perpetually infected by scores, maybe hundreds of bacteria and viruses and other kind of diseases. And the person is perfectly healthy. And the bacteria and the viruses sit in the person's body dormant. They're not given the opportunity to multiply because the body will kill off those expansions until the person is weak. The person is hungry, the person is cold, the person is tired. There isn't sufficient energy to go around. They become sick. The onset of the sickness doesn't begin when the person becomes cold or hungry. The expression of the sickness manifests then. But you're not going to find bacteria in a place where there's no life because there's nothing to nourish the bacteria. You'll only find bacteria, sick life, where there is healthy life. And the sick life is trying to find an opportunity to take some of the life from the healthy entity. It's called a parasite. But it cannot do it when the healthy entity is really healthy. When the healthy entity has weakness, the parasite then takes advantage of that shortcoming and nourishes itself. If the parasite would succeed in killing the weakened organism, the parasite would eventually kill itself because there's no longer an opportunity for renewal of life, for sustaining life. It's spiritually identical with Tumah. Tumah is found with this Tahara, with this Kedusha. Because Klippa wants to live. And in order to live, it needs to connect itself to Kedusha and to draw from Kedusha. Klippa is trying to take from Kedusha. So the more holiness there is, the more there are negative forces, negative living things trying to take life from Kedusha. But, so long as the Kedusha is healthy, just like a person who is completely healthy biologically, they can carry all these diseases around and they'll never manifest, they'll never express themselves. Spiritually, so long as the Kedusha is strong, Klippa cannot take. That's the concept of Tumma. The concept of Tumma is not only an absence of life. The concept of Tumma is a weakening of life with, which affects the onset of negative living. The negative living is the Tumah. Where you have a weakening of Kedusha, Klippa is always ready, willing, and able to attach itself. And Tumah means it is a negative life circumstance, phenomena that attaches itself, that wraps the person. And you have to clean it up. So that's why you have to have purification. Tare, which go to the mikveh, you have to paraduma, you have to have the tziparim of a matzeda, you have to have various karbonis under the four circumstances that I mentioned before. But this is, this is the, the philosophy of it. Now, does Tumma and Tahara make sense? Does it make sense if a person touches a dead body, they become spiritually impure? Because touching that dead body gives them a connection to something that's somehow alive, but alive in such a diminished way. There's a huge force of negative life taken from it, and you become affected by it. It makes sense if you understand Ruchnius. It doesn't make sense if you understand biology and chemistry, but if you understand the Ruchnius, you understand spirituality, it makes sense. It's a Rashi which appears in Chumit in a number of places. And Rashi says, in effect, he brings Amar Ab Chumit, or Tana Amar Ab Chumit, that Yidin have many more mitzvahs than Goyim. Even the Goyim are very wonderful, and they're in heaven on our side of the wall, Yedu HaSipur. <laughs> but they, they have fewer mitzvahs. Why? Because they have less spiritual ruchnizdike sensitivity and therefore they have less concerns, less things to be afraid of, less issues that could affect them spiritually in an adverse way, in a negative way. I'll give you a simple example. If a person is not very musical, for them to enjoy music is not very difficult. If a person is exceptionally musical, for them to enjoy music is rare. If a person is not very artistic, for them to enjoy art is not very difficult. If a person is extremely refined and sensitized to what's real art, they're very difficult to please. The same is true in fashion, same is true in architecture, in interior design, whatever, you, cars, remaking engines, three carburetors and so many uh, uh, horsepower and so many cylinders. 
the more expertise you have, the finer the necessity for, for usefulness, for effectiveness. The Ebesh gave Yidin more mitzvahs because the Yidin have a spiritual capacity for, for fineness. Because they have a spiritual capacity for fineness, Hashem says, I'm going to teach you how to refine yourself. Some people view it as a lot of limitations and restrictions and, uh, obstru- uh, you know, being boxed in, being imprisoned. But the Abish did a saying, you have the capacity to be holy. I'm going to make you, I'm going to teach you how to be holy. And you need to have a finer standard in order to be able to achieve this. Like I told you many times before, if a person is a wine taster, they cannot drink bad wine. They cannot drink bad wine because it tastes terrible. And they cannot drink bad wine because if they drank bad wine, they'd lose their ability to taste fine wine. Coarse person, says an ayyem yayim, chaf el, take a look. Ain't of us is nidri kongrub, one who is low and coarse, unrefined, is nishmargish, is not aware that he's coarse and unrefined. A crude person doesn't view crudeness as crudeness. He views it as being ordinary. A fine person, you know, people who, people who are fine, I don't mean religious, fine, are disturbed when people speak loud. And the people who speak loud say, you know, you you got an issue, you got a problem, you you're 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 afraid of your own shadow. Now, it, that may be the case, but it also may be the case that a person is refined. One of the expressions of refinement is a softness, a softness of step, a softness of communication, a softness of interaction, a softness. Touch is soft. Everything is fine. A person doesn't have those sensitivities. Not only is it fine, but believes that person is out of lunch, living in dreamland. When I don't appreciate your feel for music, I'm convinced that you're selling yourself to Brooklyn Bridge. In other words, it's not I don't understand what you understand. I believe that you're imagining it. This is, what, this is the problem with spirituality. Talk to a person about the Ruchnius, about spirituality. He says, you're off the wall. You're out of your mind. If I'm going to eat this food, I'm not going to be able to relate to God, or I want to do with the other. But it does. In order to appreciate that eating this food offsets my relationship to God, you have to not eat it. <laughs> and even then, it's not so simple to want to attain that sensitivity. So there are these different standards. There are these different standards. The Abish to set that It's not just don't eat treif. It's not just uh, don't touch dead body, walk into the base of Mektosh. Live a life of refinement. These mitzvahs, these instructions, this is pure, this is impure, create a sensibility and a sensitivity which opens a person up to spirituality. Spirituality is very difficult to prove, arguably impossible to prove. But we're not learning philosophy, we're learning Taita. In other words, we're not in the proof business. We're in the interpreting what we believe business. And Yiddishkeit says there are very fine levels of ruchnius which a person can attain and it warrants purity. Which leads me to a number of other points. Number one, I mentioned a few moments ago that there is no requirement to be pure. Unless you're a priest, a koyin. In the times of the Beis HaMikdash, a koyin was not allowed to be impure for one second more than necessary. If he became spiritually impure in whatever way, he was required minatayra to purify himself. An Israelite, a Levite, you have no obligation to be pure except when the Yom Tev comes and you do it in the Beis HaMikdash. However, Jews who were pious introduced a phenomenon called chulin betara. Chulin betara means that the ordinary life, ordinary life should be tohir, should be pure. That even when they're not going into the Beis HaMikdash, their, their, their common piece of bread should be pure. This movement, this group of people who adapted this idea that even though I'm not going to the Beis HaMikdash, I want to live in a state of purity, were called chaverim, fellows, members of a group, of an inner circle. In the time of the first Beis HaMikdash, it seems there was no necessity to establish this group called fellowship, because everybody, everybody, even simple people, knew and appreciated the spiritual value of purity. We were all chaverim. Everybody, you became Tony, you went to the mikveh. You went to the mikveh, not because there's a problem of not going to the mikveh. You don't want to be unclean if you can be clean, spiritually speaking. In the time of the second base of Mikdash, the spiritual level and uh, care of Yidin diminished 
So there was a group called Chaverim. And the Chaverim set standards about not eating in the homes of Amanatim. Not just because of kosher and treif, but because of pure and impure. Now, they're trying to create segregation, but they were trying to retain a spiritual fineness which is affected by Tumantar. So the laws are pure and impure. So Hasidah says, and it's explained in Sfarim, in one of the many, many commentaries I have here, in one of the Rikantis, he lists seven categories. There is Chulid, or Paras HaKadosh, eating Chulid, ordinary food, in a condition of holiness. There's a second category called Maiser Sheni. Maiser Sheni, the second tithe, had to be eaten with pure and dirty. The third standard would be Truma, what's given to the priest, to the holy Koyin, which has a special Allah of Kedusha and so forth. The fourth would be Kadashim, uh, Karbanis. And the fifth would be Paras Khatas, Paraduma, actually the red heifer. And there, there are different standards of Tahara for each. A Kohen Gadol had to be in the highest state of Tahara. A Levi had to be in the lesser standard of Tahara. A Jew who was eating mice had to be in the lesser standard of Tahara. And there are all these different standards of Tahara. And um, people tried their best in those days to retain Tahara in the belief that it affects your ability to learn Tahara. It affects your ability to connect to Hashem. It affects your whole life. This is not something you can explain psychologically. It's beyond the psyche. You can only explain it spiritually. But in the realm of spirituality, it's real. In other words, we do have an Ashama. We believe in spirituality, but we're just regular people. In the realm of spirituality, this was a very... It, it was a real thing. It affected... A, a tuma affected a person in an adverse way. Uh, I'll tell you two little things. One is, to me, a most amazing effect. A most amazing thing. The Friedrich Rebbe has a description, as a biography, of his grandmother, Rebbe Sinifke, his father's mother. It's a long biography, it's a very involved one. He knew her well. She raised him. She passed away only six years before her son, his father. She lived a long time. And she was a great tzaddikis, a very fine woman, a very wise woman, and unbelievably religious. The Friedrich Rebbe writes, she had six children. Nobody in their home ever raised their voice. She had six children. Six kids is a lot of kids. She was married to the Ramarash. But the parents never raised their voices to the children. The children never raised their voices to the parents. The children never raised their voices to one another. Why? Because they were told they're going to get whiplash, they can get the head back to It's an unbelievable fineness of character, Prussian. It's a fineness of character, to be very blunt, I don't want to speak in anybody else's behalf, I'll speak on my behalf, there is shouting in my home, and not just from the four-year-olds, or the oh, even 12-year-olds. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, you just need to be interpreted, sometimes you need a pshat, sometimes you need a garment, sometimes you need a little paint, and sometimes you need to close up the windows. <laughs> Some, just sometimes. A, a home where nobody shouts, and you're talking about healthy people, there weren't... People, you know, they weren't, sometimes people are just so rigid, they're so psychologically suppressed that they can't raise their voices. They were healthy people. But they, they were pushing to be fine human beings. It's a muscle for Tahara. The second, the Tama Maisim at Mount Nereb, the Alt Nereb, had three classes that he taught Hasidus to in the very early years. And he had, it was a hand-selected group of great geniuses and great servants of Hashem whom he personally taught Cheder Aleph, Cheder Beis, and Cheder Gimel. The first Cheder, the second Cheder, the third Cheder. The highest level was Cheder Aleph. And the lowest level was Cheder Gimel. One of the members of Cheder Aleph was a chassid, a giant, by the name of Rav Zalman Zezma. Rav Zalman Zezma was the mashpia of Rabbi Hillel of Parach. Just a small idea of who he was. Now, who was the Hillel of Parach? We'll leave it for another time. The Alter had a policy. That when he said chassid is for one group, the other groups were not permitted to attend. But it wasn't only that when he said Hasidus for the greater group, the members of the lesser group couldn't attend. But the opposite was also true. When he said Hasidus for Chayda Gimel, for the lowest group, the Talmidim of the higher Chabad were not permitted. The B'zalman Zezma very much wanted to hear the Rebbe's Hasidus, he says to the youngest group. So he asked the guys that they should hide him under the table. And I'm sure he offered them a good prize and reward in return, but it probably wasn't money. But he would exchange Hasidus for them. Anyway, he comes into the room and he waits. And then it turns out that the Alter Rebbe postponed the Chassidus. 
So he says, you know, I'm going to go lay down. Call me when the Rebbe's coming. So he went and he lay down. The Rebbe came abruptly. So they ran and they woke him up and he came running into the room. I didn't have a chance to watch Negevasa. But it wasn't night. It was daytime. You don't have to watch Negevasa to lay down during the day. He ran into the room. He right, He climbed under the table. The al walks in. As he walks into the door, he says, Ruach Tumme in here. He's a spirit of Tumme. And of Zalman Zesme ran out. al Rebbe killed two birds at one stone. He taught him a lesson and he wasn't there by the Hasidus. He said, Ruach Tumme in here. This third Maggid in Al Terebe. Al Terebe was very poor. He came to his Rebbe. And he had one glass. Came Pesach. He couldn't afford to buy another. So he koshered his chomet stick a glass. The way you kosher a glass is you fill it with water to the brim. You let it sit for 24 hours. You empty it. You fill it with water to the brim. You let it sit for 24 hours. Three times. This is a halach. But it's disputed in the Paschim. Comes to the Seder, everybody sits down around the table. Al Terebe sits down. The Maggit is down in his place, and he's sitting. He's very uncomfortable, very disturbed. And he's not starting, he's just, just fidgeting. He's just unsettled. Finally, he gets up, he starts walking around the table. He walks, he stops, he walks, he stops, he walks, he stops, he walks, he stops. He comes to the Al Terebe. He stops, he stands, he stands, he picks up the cup. Where'd you get the cup? Al Terebe tells him the truth. He says that Amor is standing next to me. He's not letting me start to say that he says that in his opinion there's chametz at my table. <laughs> Take the cup away and you'll share mine. That this was the Magid of Zeich. Now, today we shared the Halik of Magid. But explain that. So that's biology, that's chemistry, that's physics. It's not even psychology. It's Luchnius. The whole phenomenon of Tumentare is in this realm. You, 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 you know, you, t- you touch a, a rodent, you become tummy. A person has a natural body or mission, they become tummy. He's a ruchnius. The point is, this ruchnius affects our ability to learn Tayra, to connect to the Eibishter, and so on and so forth. And the central mechanism for the, for the correction of tummy is mikvah. I said to you, sometimes there are things preceding mikvah. Sometimes there are carbonus subsequent to mikvah. But the central issue is mikvah. So, now that it's a quarter to 11, Let's learn about mikvah. Okay, I, I think the introduction was good and important. So begin with the Rambam. And I'm going to first read a little bit inside. I'm reading where I made the arrow, the very first page. Your staple should be on your left. Dover Baro, this is the very last law of the entire book of Tare in the Rambam. Dover Baro, the Gali. This is obvious and well known. Shatum is the whole notion of pure and impure. Gzeiras Akosafein, their divine decree. In other words, you can't explain why one is pure and another is not pure. It doesn't make any sense. The Ainan Midvaram, it's not in the category of such things. Shedaiti Shalada Machraata, that the human mind would resolve such. You would never think to say this is a tum. You would never think to say this is a tada and so forth. And therefore, it goes into the category of laws which we call chukim, unreasonable laws. In the world of Rambam and Asag, there are only two categories of mitzvahs. Shemias and Mukubalis. Shemias means mitzvahs which you can explain, and Shemias and Mukubalis are mitzvahs you cannot explain. The Ramban is the one who introduces us the three categories, A, this Chukim and Mishpatim. But until the Ramban, laws that don't make any sense, laws that make complete sense, and laws that make sense once you accept the Torah. Like Shabbos, since Hashem created the world in six days, and rested in seven days, so Shabbos makes sense. But you would not invent it on your own. So the Ramban divides mitzvahs into three, but the, the Rasag and the Rambam and those who came before the Ramban have two categories of mitzvahs. Um, all the laws of Tomentare. Paraduma, Tumasmes, Tsaras, Zova Zova, Tumas Mishkeva Meshev, Ovesa Tumas, the Rabbinic Tumas, it's all clear as a cause. It's all higher than human comprehension. Vechain, in addition, Hatvila Menatuma, the notion of being immersing oneself in water and becoming cleansed from the Tumas, being re, 
resensitized. He goes into the category of reasonless laws. She'ein hatuma tit eitzaya. Tuma is not mud or excrement. Shetava b'mayim, which is sort of washing away with water as you would filth. Alexander Sakosavi, it's a divine edict that says that when you immerse yourself in water, you become spiritually pure. Stop. There are two mechanisms for immersion in water purity. And it's important that I mention it now. It's going to come up later. I mean, I don't know how much we're going to cover, but there are two ways that a person can be purified from water. And in Kabbalah, this is extremely significant. The first is from a mount, mayan, from a fountain, from a source, from a subterranean source of water. A mayan, a fountain, is called mayim chayim, living waters. And the halacha about a mayan is, the law about a fountain is, that there are no laws. There's no restrictions whatsoever to immersing yourself in a fountain as long as you can get your whole body into it. The water that flows from a fountain, as long as it's attached to the fountain, even if it flows out of the fountain, doesn't have to be still, it could be moving. It doesn't have to have 40 measures of water, it could be a drop. If you can get a needle into a tiny little puddle that's outside the fountain, the needle, the needle was tummy, it becomes tired. A human being needs more water because they have more value, more mass. They take up more room. But there is no inherent requirement for a minimum mikvah size in a fountain. As long as you got your whole body into the mikvah of, of, of well water, you're 100% pure. How do you get your body into it if it doesn't have 40 saw? The din is, the shir of men saw is that gufish uh, available. That's the reason for the Huh? Yeah, but that's a shayin chumis. Gufi shlom. A mikvah is shalosh amis alama. The shear of forty saw is three cubits by a cubit, because a human being needs four cubits. But the head you can shrink, so you need to have three cubits by a cubit. Forty saw is almost exactly a shear of shalosh amis by an amma. It's, it's an amma by an amma by three amas. That's a shayin of mikvah. It's designed to accommodate a human body. So if a diesel's mikvah didn't have memsla, you'd love to get in. But okay, be that as it may. <laughs> a diesel's mikvah is not ashbeiden, it's reichelen, because it's a maya, it's a fountain. Yeah, that's yeah. It. yeah, but it doesn't, you say it has... A hole in the rock. Yeah, but it has 40 so, I mean, you get your body into it. Just as I... Ah, well. Um, there are no laws at all that govern a maya. The catch becomes this. The waters of a fountain flow into a river. That's where rivers come from. The problem is, when waters gather in rivers, there's a combination of two sources. A, fountains. B, rainwater runoff from snow especially. And Allah would say that whatever the majority is would determine the status of the mikveh. If more than 50% of the water comes from a fountain, it has a din of a fountain, and you can just title on the river plain. If, however, the majority of the waters are from rainwater, they're from snow melt, then you would, then you would have the problem of a real mikveh. And the Gemara says that there was a the, the Shmuel allowed his daughters to title in the mikveh, in the river in the Pras and in the, in the uh, Euphrates, except at the end of the summer and at the end of the winter. At the end of the summer, he was afraid God forbid they would uh, they would drown because there was a lot of Snow. At the end of the winter, because of the melt, the snow melt, the majority of the water was not water from a fountain. The majority of the water was from rainwater. So the mikvah was possible thing would build them what we call a mikvah today. But the, otherwise, the majority of the water of the Euphrates is fed by by Mayan mikipi mivrech from fountains, and there's no halachas at all. The second kind of a mikvah is what we call today an ashboiden. Ashboiden means a hole in the ground, and the water must be stationary. It's not allowed to be moving. And there's also a shear. You have to have 40 measures of water. Memsa, 40 shear of water. Otherwise, the mikveh is not kosher. This is called, and you have to have ashbayden, and it's not the last memsa. So there are two systems of mikveh. Mikveh that's called mayim chayim, living water. And then there is ashbayden, which could be rainwater as well. One stipulation there is in all kinds of mikveh. The moment water is put into a vessel, it's no good. If you put rainwater into a vessel, it's no good for a mikveh. And even if you then spill it back into the ground, it don't work. Water has to be natural, has to be flowing on the ground, flowing from the fountain. The minute you put it into a vessel, that's why a mikveh, building a mikveh, the biggest complication of building a mikveh is how do you make a basin that's not halachically a basin. 
Because if it's halacha, we get basin, the water becomes possible the moment it enters the mikveh. So you have to build, huh? But the mikveh has tiles. Yeah. <laughs> the walls and the floor of the mikveh, do they constitute a kli? There's all kinds of halachas about how they design mikvahs that the water should never be in a keli. Water passes through pipes. Does the, is the pipe a keli? There's all kinds of halachas. Very complicated halachas. Making a mikvah is not a simple gesheft. Um, because once the water goes into a vessel, it becomes unfit to immerse itself. But the, the, that's why you pour it in, you, you don't have, if you would uh, first pour it and put it into the ground, then it would be very clean. That's right. No, but you also don't want the mikvah itself to be a clean. Could you make a bathtub in the mikvah? A bathtub is a big, big keili. Is it a keili? If it's a keili, then it can't make it into a mikvah. If it's not a keli, you can make it into a mikvah. Uh, I'm, I listen, I'm not answering the questions. I'm simply observing the difficulties. That's why the tiles, in fact, they don't, they don't attach them with glue. They take actually a thin set. actually concrete. The the tile from the mikvah becomes part of the part of the wall actually. Because of the problem of keli, the biggest problem with mikvahs is not so much the tile as the pipes. How the the pipes? The water has to come from the roof into the basement. And one of the things that they do, we we one of the chumas that we have is you never pour water directly into the mikvah. You pour it on the ground and allow it to spill into the mikveh. It's, it's a, the no, no, the water comes from the roof down into the basement. Oh, first it goes so it doesn't go through a pipe. It goes through a half pipe. They cut a pipe in half. They put it against the brick of the home. And the water runs in such a way that it's not running on the rubber side of the keli. It's rubbing on the stone side, on the brick side of the vessel. In addition to that, when the water comes to the basin, the basin it doesn't run directly into the hole of mikvah water. It runs onto the ground and falls into. It's called meshiche. It's another way of making the mikvah more kosher. Mikvah happens to be one of those things where, besides the fact that it's very complicated, we like to adopt every chumre. By mikvah, we try to make every chumre possible. The way we make mikvahs today has every possible chumre, every yeshemin. We try to make mikvahs very, very, very kosher. Well, it either is or isn't a mikvah. If you make it, you make it right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Good, good, good. Now, anyway. Wait, wait, here am I. Where am I? Thus, the significance and meaning of mikvah depends on your kavana. Since it's true that in essence, mikvahs and the whole notion of pure and impure are higher than reason, the meaning that will attach to mikvah depends on our on our kavana. Lefichach amru chachamim. The rabbis therefore said, "Taval." V'lo huchsak kilo taval. If a person tavled and v'lo huchsak, I think he wasn't having a kavana when he tavled. It's as though he didn't tavel. The only kind of tevila which you have to have no kavana for is tevila for chulin. In other words, if you fall into a mikvah, you can eat chulin without sakedish. But you can't eat truma. If you want to eat truma, you have to have a table with a kavana for truma. And if you table with a kavana for truma, you're tame lekedesh. You have to go to mikvah again if you want to eat a carbon. And if you table the mikvah for a carbon and you want to participate in the red heifer, you have to table again. Because the kavana affects the level of purity. What you're thinking when you immerse affects how pure you are. The afa pikei, nevertheless. Remez yesh bedava. There's a huge remez in the whole phenomenon of mikvah. And that is, when a person pays attention and focuses on the idea, I want to be purified. Once that person immerses himself, he becomes pure. Although nothing has changed in their body, the same is true spiritually. Just like physically, the immersion doesn't change you, yet your intent affects a change because you went into the water. The same is true spiritually. When someone intends to purify his soul, not from being unclean because he touched a dead body, but from being unclean, meaning to be crude, coarse, unrefined. From spiritual uncleannesses. 
Shay which means people allow themselves to think what kind of stupid thoughts, the deus heroes and bad ethos, bad values, bad priorities. If a person decides, you know what, I'm not going to sp- say profanity anymore. No. How big an evade is profanity, especially today in America, it's a big mitzvah of profanity. But the fact is, as in Svarim, A, profanity is an exposure of what's happening inside, and B, profanity profanes the inside of a person. If a person decides, I will not speak any more dirty words. The resolution itself is refining. The upkeep of that resolution affects your whole host. Yeah. You stop thinking like a hillbilly, you become oyster. You actually refine yourself, right? So the Rabbim says like this, Kivin Chehiskim Belibe, once a person resolves in his heart, lift fresh to separate himself, the ace and the from those priorities. He just made the resolution. He hasn't lived for a week without profanity. He's decided to refine himself. The heavy nafsha and he's brought his spirit, the meyadas into pure ethos. He's decided not to entertain stupid and perverse value systems, what they call in our culture lifestyles. But instead to focus on value systems and lifestyles that are refined and sensitized and spiritual. The decision to prioritize those, the decision to immerse yourself intellectually, emotionally into those value systems, Harei Huwayim the Basak said, you have just been to a spiritual mikvah, a mikvah of ideas. Like there's a mikvah of water, there's a mikvah of an idea. The immersion in finer ideas makes you a finer person, as the mikvah in water makes you a pure person. Even the Pasik says, I will spray on you, sprinkle on you pure waters. You'll be purified from all your spiritual uncleanness. You'll be purified from all your uh, pagan ways. And I will refine you. The Rambam writes in the Mayan of Uchem, in the guide to the text very emphatically, that the pagans were very spiritual people. But uh, they weren't clean. They weren't clean. It pushed it hygienically, they were not clean. And, and they believed in filth. They believed in. Uh, in, in, in disgusting things. They, 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 they saw spiritual value in things that are disgusting, like eating snakes and drinking blood. So the Ramamites, a lot of the mitzvahs were given to us to offset toyeva, abominable things. Abominable things. There's a machlik, it's a shame, how you translate the word toyeva. But some of the shame say toyeva means things that are so disgusting that if Hashem wouldn't tell you they're disgusting, you'd know they're disgusting on your own separating yourself from perversions, from disgusting things in your mind, is a t- t- feel in a mikvah. It's an immersion in a mikvah. So the first interpretation of the meaning and significance of mikvah is just as you table your body, you can table your mind. Decide to spend your time learning chassidus. I'll tell you a nice story. There's a yid. Today he's a big shliach. And he was once a big shliach. But in the middle he had a fall, a spiritual nefila. He took off his kapata, he became very modern, he trimmed his beard, and if you know what I'm talking about, you'll realize that for him it was a big deal. And he started to read other philosophies. And he's a brilliant guy. And he read all these philosophies and he became depressed. You know, all these ideas. And he had Yechidus with the Rebbe. And he had Yechidus with the Rebbe in the 80s when the Rebbe didn't have Yechidus. It was an exception. He had been a shliach, he had been a very important shliach. When did he start reading? The Rebbe, 1975, he stopped for locals, for visitors, 1981. And so this was an exception. He had a with the Rebbe. And he decided he's going into the Rebbe not with a kapota. He's not going to wear a sh- kapota. He, he stopped wearing a kapota Shabbos. He was wearing an ordinary, he stopped wearing, he would wear a business suit Shabbos and a gatl. So he says he's not going to fool the Rebbe. He's going to walk into the Rebbe. Let the Rebbe see who he is, you know. And the Rebbe had a very special Yechidus with him. And the Rebbe pushed him, charged him. He, he infused life into him. He came out of his depression, and he, you know, today he's very successful again. But a couple of things that I ever told him, you know what I'm talking about? A couple of things that I ever told him, that Yechidus, <laughs> this is no, before no, you no, came on the scene this time. I thought you were going to say, stay as a very successful businessman. No, no. <laughs> one, of, one of those, one of the, I know two things that I ever told him. I heard it almost, I heard it in probably 82, 83. It was mamish fresh. The Rebbe said to him, a younger man they did have learned chassidus. A ganzin talk. They said a man like you should sit a whole day and learn chassidus instead of reading all these German philosophies and you know Greek philosophies and Spanish philosophies. Learn chassidus. Another thing the Rebbe told him. The Rebbe said, "Believe me, believe me. All the philosophies are in chassidus. Every idea, any philosophy, 
is found in Chassidus. Let in Chassidus, there's that now skip in him. Let in Chassidus, you'll find everything. Of course, he didn't agree with the Rebbe. Why not? Because he didn't see all the philosophies in Chassidus. The Rebbe saw all the philosophies in Chassidus. You know why? Because he didn't read the other philosophies. He didn't have the heaviness that the other philosophies imposed. So the immersion in a finer philosophy is a, it's a purification. The ideas change your behavior, they change your life, they change your goof. They change your condition of cleanness. Okay? So did we finish our first explanation of mikvah? Turn the page. The next you have is a chinuch. And the Sefer Achinuch has two commentaries about mikvah, and I very carefully um, indicated it. You see where I did it? I made an arrow on both sides of the page, and I made a double line in the middle. Ubitam hamayim. The reason why it is that water affects a purification of all spiritual impurity, says, says the Chinuch, I am going to give you a simple, commonsensical um, interpretation. I will give a very basic why, is why it is water that is the selected medium for purification. It's a very interesting shot. Would have been too difficult hang on a second. Hang on. But he mentions in the course of it not only why water is the foundation of spiritual purification, but why once the water goes into a vessel, it's unfit, it's obsolete. And he says like this, he that as follows, I'm spiritually unclean, and I want to cleanse myself. He says, cleanse is renewal. It's renewal. Starting over. Water, immersion in water indicates renewal. You'll see why momentarily. One should construe himself once he's immersed himself as though he were created at that moment. Born again, right? As was the case with the whole world. When Hashem created the world, what was the condition of the world? The earth was covered completely with water. And in order to give the world purpose, Hashem had to lift the continents, which it says in Svarim, Lareka Oretz Al Hamoyim Kili Elam Chastei, to lift the earth above the water is considered a pitera nest. Hey Prateva, the state of Rabbi Nachai and the Rishonim, because water should be water is lighter than earth; it should hover above it. The the offsetting of that, that the continents should rise as a nest in Hashemayim. But the condition of the world is water above the earth, so water above the earth symbolizes birth, renewal. So immersing your whole body in water. It's like your world being covered with water again, and then when the world re-emerges, the continent, your body emerges from the water, it's a new entity. Nayazach. Ki'ilu nivra as though the man was created at that moment. Just as the world as a whole was mayim, was completely covered with water, terem ayes by adam, prior to the presence of man and continents. it's written the chomesh v'ruach halakim malachav zafnei amayim. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of all of the water. The same is true when you go to mikveh. The uniqueness of mikveh is being completely surrounded, enveloped by water. There's nothing besides for the water. This is the, the Rebbe once said. It is two mikvehs, two mitzvahs that completely embrace you. Mikveh and sukkah. But there's a difference between mikveh and sukkah. Everybody tables and water separately. When it comes to sukkah, there's a notion of inclusiveness. Everybody can share the same sukkah. The unity of sukkah is more complicated. It's more involved than the... I understand, but each person, if the two bodies are touching, it's chitza. You have to have your own water surrounding only you. Look of the will. A person should apply to his thought in his imagination, just as his body has been renewed by being completely enveloped in water and then emerging from the water, he should renew his actions, his behavior to be favorable, make his deeds more kosher, be adaptive and be more precise, but that he has his baruch in the ways of God Almighty. Okay? The Alkain says, for this reason also, the Gemara says, you cannot use for purification water that, have, that are in a vessel or have even passed through a vessel. It needs to be living water. Living water is water from a fountain. 
Oi, Muchunasim, gathered, but Shehei Nalkaka Lebekli. You have to be in the ground, what's called in Teda Ashboiden, a hole in the ground, but not in a vessel. Mikomoke, Kidei, what's wrong with tiling in a huge bathtub? And by the way, there's a concept called. There's a halach of Teda, a keli is beyond a certain size, it's not a din of a kli. Bob Amida. Kali, Kli, eight above a meter. If it's above a certain size, you don't it lay. It's not carried moly You don't carry it full and empty. The Allah about a vessel is a vessel is only considered a vessel. Is it just like you can carry it when it's empty? You can carry it when it's full. If a vessel is so large that if it would be full, it would be impossible to carry. So even when it's empty, it's not a Kli. Paz Certain Kli, certain Kalim. It can't become, become Tommy. It's question of a mik. Right, can't become Tommy. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not a clean. Whatever the case is, whatever it is, but uh, don't make a mikvah at home. We'll leave it to Menachem and his uh, engineers. Why is it that once the water is in a vessel, it's unfit for a mikvah? That the person should envision in his thought as though the whole world were water. And he's been renewed by Lay Mehem. Uh, and when you have departments, in other words, you're in a body of water. But you don't want to feel like you're in a local body of water. You want to feel like the whole world is water. You put the water in a vessel. The vessel has walls. Yes, I'm in water, but I'm in a limited quantity of water. The im ye amayim bakli. If the water is in a vessel, or you have to fill because they simply passed through the kli and they're no longer in the kli. You no know, longer can envision by being in this water that I'm connected to the infinity of water in the world. Everything in a vessel has a limit. So the Chazal say, when the water goes into a keli, it's limiting the water. It's taking away this property of my whole world is water. And therefore, the concept of tabling in a mikveh is renewal. But you want it to be infinite waters, and it's represented by the lot of not allowing the waters to go into a vessel. The second pshat, the very interesting pshat, the Rambam spoke about immersion in ideas, and thinking finer ideas makes you a finer person. He defines mikveh as being a renewal. Turn the page. Uh, no, just flip over the packet. Flip over the packet. Near the bottom, uh, I made arrows. Uh, four lines from the bottom. The I want to say something more about it. The chinuch here is very bekitzet, very abbreviated, because he says, "I already told you in the beginning of the parsha, which is the page we read before, the kavanah of mikveh." Here he just has one more thought. She has in the idea of mikveh remez, a hint. El ha to one who is immersing himself, and that is she nakin You should cleanse your soul from every sin. That Kimesha Teva Mayim, Lenaki is called Dover Mishapes Bahem, just as water physically cleans physical filth, the immersion in the mikvah means you should spiritually clean spiritual filth. Meaning to say, you need to do tshuva. Going to the mikvah is, a, is an indicator of cleansing. Not passive cleansing, proactive cleansing. I'm immersing myself in physical water which physically cleanses me. I need to now proactively immerse myself in a spiritual event of, of cleansing. And refining um, by uh, doing tshuva, which is the mikvah for Avedis. This is a third commentary, a third insight into the definition and the meaning of mikvah. Okay? Like I said to you, nobody should feel compelled to stay except Menachem because I'm in his home. And also, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, he's staying by no choice. Now, Rabbi Sai, there is a Zoyhar here. There's a Zoyhar which I printed. This Zoyhar, it's really that I am a Hem Netzadik Zayin, which speaks about. Tavling specifically on, on Shavuos. I'm going to skip this there. Okay, it's here for, for me to feel like I have a bigger Mitzvah and for, to give the aid and more papers to Shlapa to California. With my card. Oh, here it is. Now, after the Zoya, you have a Rikanti. The Rikanti is page Reishut Ches, and then you have also Reishchot and Chafalaf. So, you see what I underlined? The Alkain, Tzorech, Litair, Bemayim. He says like this. This is why a person must purify himself more. This is already more Kabbalistic. 
He says, Rem is Lamaim or Yenim. This is an allusion to the supernal waters. She may may achesed, it's the waters of kindness. Okay? I'm skipping the next line. Valkein mevarcham alamayim shakali abadvare shenemar elim chasibana. Vamida hasmolis, the negative, the left, the alien mida, is nikras ish, it's called fire. Mi mayim, that is separated from water. It says that a kanti vihine hatum abamina ish, spiritual impurity comes from fire, and therefore vataram and amayim, the purification must come from water. Asheroim de maila shviyish, which stands on the seventh. Step and he enumerates. I said to you before that there's seven levels of purity. Here he enumerates the seven steps of impurity. Did you say fire came from water? Is that what you... Yeah, it says in Tzavitzira. Esh mi mayim, mayim yesh. There's a concept of fire coming from water, concept of water coming from fire. What's so relevant? To fire? What's what, what's relevant to us is not that it came from fire, but that it's separated from the fire. Because it's separated from the fire, there's an impurity. Keitzat. Ve'ena tumen egas akat sheish ktavis. Tumen touches only six levels. And the purity is the seventh level. In other words, there's six sides, three dimensions, that's reality. The seventh is the place of purity. Aviyah Vasatuma, the encountering, the dead body itself is the first. Avatuma, the person who touches the dead body is the second. Drishna Tuma, the one who touches the one who touches the dead body is the third. Rivi Shaini, the one who touches the one who touched the one who touched the body is Shaini, and this is Khulu. This is called Khulu Antalas Akedish. Chamishi lay is truma, the sixth one is Kaddish. Oh, many halachas. If, if you're Rishon Latuma, you could be Matana Tuma, you can Dama Echel Namashkin. If you're Shani Latuma, you cannot be. In other words, the transmission of Tuma is limited. In halacha, there are two terms Tomei and Pasal. The difference between Tomei and Pasal means I'm impure and I can give it to you. Pasal means I'm impure but I can't transmit it. So the halacha is that a body, a human being, and a vessel can only be an Ava Tumah or a Rishan Tumah. It can either be the highest level of Tumah or the next level. It's called a Rishan. But if, say, you went to a Levaya, and you're an Ava Tumah, you touch me, I'm Rishan Tumah. I touch him, he's pure. I touch this cup, it's pure. I touch this piece of cake, it's Tumah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oichon Amashkin, food and drink, can have more Tumah than a human being or a vessel. More receptive. If this piece of bread were Truma. I could touch this bottle, the water in this soda, and it would touch this, and it would become a shlishi Tuma. If that were a carbon, a shlishi Tuma could be, a carbon could have four levels of Tuma. And paraschatos, paraduma can have five levels of Tuma. In other words, the holier it is, the more sensitive it is. You can eat it. But a kayan can't eat it. You can't eat it and go into the base of mikdash. And if it's, if it's, Truma, and it becomes Tama, you have to burn it. You can't eat Truma. Truma is a Misa If a Kayan eats Truma and the Truma is Tama, he's, he's a terrible Avena. Yeah, he can destroy he it. it. Even, he doesn't know about it, that's another story, but he's not allowed to eat Truma that becomes um, Tama. It's very serious Allahas. Is this also pertaining when a body, like if you touch an instrument to a body and then that instrument becomes Tama? Then anybody who touches that instrument also picks up the tummy? No, a person cannot become tummy from a keli. Except a, a chalal, a knife, a sword, because a chalal is a chalif. Most kalim can't become a tummy. Okay, this is so complicated. It's so complicated. An animal has a mum, it's not tummy, as long as it's alive. When it dies, it's tummy. It's not tummy because of the mum, it's tummy because of death. Now, I want you to contemplate this. The, the Rekanti says here, the Rekanti says here, I want to enlighten this. He says, fire is Tum and water is Tahada. I don't know what the Rekanti means, but I'm going to speculate. But the speculation is going to mean that I'm going to offer you a compromised definition of Tum. We're now entering the realm of Kabbalah. The first three interpretations we gave are Nigla, or Chakira, philosophy. Now entering the realm of Kabbalah. And I want you to, you know, I always do this. What is the difference, as, as far as Tum and Tada is concerned, between Nigla and Kabbalah? What is the difference? How does philosophy view pure and impure? How does mysticism view pure and impure? The difference is this. As I've told you, philosophy says the whole structure of Judaism is about man and the refinement of man. Kabbalah says... 
the structure of Judaism is not only about man, it's about the supernal man. It's about the other ma'alia. It's about the lakus. In other words, philosophy says pure and impure is only a relationship to the person. Kabbalah says pure and impure are real ideas. They're tr- if there'd be no people, they'd be true. So philosophy would say, Hashem said to you to tell the mikvah. Because Hashem wants you to be refined. And He's saying that when you go to the mikvah, you're refining yourself. Is there real refinement in the mikvah? No. But it affects you in a refining way. Therefore, Hashem gave this mitzvah. Philosophy views the whole Yiddishkeit like Nitnu Aminitz. Mitzvah is all about man's refinement. Is there a real concept of spiritual impurity in heaven? No. There's a, there is a psychological concept of spiritual uncleanness, which Hashem attaches to spiritual phenomena and says, immerse yourself in the mikvah and be purified. As opposed to Kabbalah. Kabbalah would say, pure and impure happens on high as well. In Atilas, in the spiritual realms, there's connected and separated. There's strong and weak. Strong is pure. Weak is impure. And therefore, the whole notion of tahara, of being refined and purified, it's not just the human experience. There's a credibility. It's the truth to it. There's a mystical truth to being spiritually unclean or to the, the idea of spiritual uncleanness. And there's correspondingly a mystical truth to the idea of being spiritually cleansed. Okay? So I think that what the Rakanti is saying is as follows. What is the difference between fire and water? I'll see this. Fire separates. Water brings together. Water has an adhesive quality. Has a teva abdveikus, says Hasidus. The whole structure of water is to bring things together. Later on, we get to Hasidus. We're going to start talking about the connection between water and tainuk. And pleasure. Mayim atzmichim kolmine tainuk. But the Rikanti isn't taking it that far. Rikanti isn't saying that water is an element associated with pleasure but it's an element associated with adhesion, with union. He says, fire has to do with tumma. What's the concept? The concept is very simple. When you take anything, take any person, take any project, take anything, and dissect it, analyze it, and analyze it, and analyze it, and analyze it, and analyze it, you'll find garbage. you find what? Garbage, junk. No person is perfect. No project is without static. In the real world, there's good and bad. And if you're looking for problems, you'll find them. What do they call it in politics? Investigations. Independent counsel. It's not about, it's not about impropriety. There's impropriety all over the place. It's about, are the political winds permitting me to expose this person's impropriety? When I got plenty of, you know, I also live in a glass house. Yeah, in my own closet. But, at this particular moment, people are not paying that close attention to me. So, if you're going to start dissecting people, you're going to find schmutz. But if you bring people into a group, everybody's schmutz is dissolved. Fire crumbles, separates things. The good aspects of the fire rise. What's left is ash, garbage. In a water, there's plenty of dirt. It dilutes it. To the extent that it becomes water itself. It says that Kanti fire is linked to impurity. When you, when you use Gavura, Gavura is more honest than Chassid. But Gavura is also more cruel than Chassid. Gavura is more cruel than Chassid. The Hilika Kotzke said, I was just thinking it this afternoon, the Kotzke said, a good is a nar, a good person is a fool, a klug is an apokadis, a smart person is a heretic. Unafrum is a rosh. And a, pi, a very religious person is a cruel man. Aladrai tzazamen, a shtickle mensch. You put all three together, a shtickle person, a shtickle mensch. If you're, if you're kind and smart and frum, you're a shtickle mensch. If you're only frum, you're a butcher with a, with a hack, with a, chopping off here. He's no good, that's no good. Taif, 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 taif. Goya potatoes, nosha, nosha. A good person is going to be exploited. A smart person is always skeptical. And a religious person is always finding fault. So the Rekanti says, fire is tumma. This tumma, the fire will find it. Water is tare. There's tumma, the water will lift it. 
this is my interpretation of the Sikhanti. I may be very wrong, because it's, it's, it doesn't sound sophisticated enough. But if my interpretation is correct, that a Kanti is simply saying water is a medium of compromise. You're not getting rid of the Tumma. You're including it. And when you include it, it becomes pure. You isolate it, it's ugly and disgusting, like the little speck of dust on top of the soup. As long as it's in the soup, it's soup. You remove it, it's garbage. Fire. It's Tumma. Fire will find filth. And in the human psyche, this is true. If you're looking for fault in a person, you'll find it. And if you're looking to forgive a person, you'll find reasons to forgive them too. Mayim is a cohesive, it's an adhesive medium. It's the nature of the existence of water is that it brings things together. You put a drop of water here and a drop of water here, it's almost a gravitational force. The two drops will merge, they'll become one drop. This tendency says a kanti is tahare, that's purity. It's a, it's a simple, it's not very sophisticated, but it's a simple insight. And it happens to be classic Kabbalah. That's how Kabbalah explains the distinction between Chassid and Gavura. You know what Kabbalah says about Chassid and Gavura? When Gavura is good, it's better than Chassid. And when Gavura is bad, it's much worse than Chassid. Chassid can't be that good because it's compromising. And Chassid can't be that bad because it's inclusive. Gavura can be much better than Chassid because it's honest to a fault. But when Gavura is bad, it's cruel. Esav is Gavura. Yishmol is, used to be chesed, evidently. They, I don't know, they, the wires got crossed. Anyway, this is the first Rikati insight on Mikveh. Turn the page. Just flip over the package. No, no, no. Don't turn the page. Flip over the package. Page Reish Chof now. This shtikele is enlightening details about the Mikveh. So far we spoke simply about the water. Water affecting purity. Now we talk about the aspects of the mikveh. And I underline three aspects. Number one, 40 saw. Number two, why the water is unfit when it's in a vessel. Number three, why did not allowed to have a chatzitza. Those are the three points that the Rikanti now explores. Chatzitza means when you touch something? Or, or just, uh, there's something on your body. Vitam tefillah bar boim sal pachas, the reason for immersion in 40 measures of water. Later on the Rikanti says, that I'm not going to tell you. That's a mystical secret. So the Levush is kind enough to explain to us why you have to have 40 measures of water on the bottom. Where I made the arrow, the second arrow. Uh, when water is in a vessel or is passed through a vessel, it's unfit. And he says, This is a great mystical secret to experts of Kabbalah. And this is consistent to a great extent with what the Chinuch said. The Chinuch said when you put water in the vessel, you don't have the concept of endlessness. And since the water is renewal, you want to have the experience of endlessness, and therefore Kaylee makes it unfit. He says like this, Ki'isha that a woman, and a woman means every one of us, Hadveikah ben Zugi, in her relationship with her partner, which is Hashem. Um, but she's pure, she's loyal, she has only one, right here. Okay. Yeah, but she has no relation with any other person except her husband. In other words, we have no relation with any other God except for the Eibishter. They send us keach b'shechina. She empowers shechina, shechina, which is the, the supernal, mis- feminine form. Shechina is feminine lemaylo. Hamakabelos mitzinir at tzaddik. That's receiving from the tzinir, from the channel of the tzaddik. Tzaddik with a yud is yosoid. Tzaddik without a yud is malchus. Okay, just trust me on this. Yosef is called a tzaddik. Tzaddik is yosoid. The, the spiritual feminine is called Shechina. The feminine masculine is called Tzaddik. When there's a loyalty from the feminine to the masculine, when there's a loyalty from the person, from us, to the Eibish there, that's ideal. But when you're taking the water from a vessel, it's coming from another source. When the water comes from the rain, when the water comes from the river, when the water's on the ground, that came straight from the Eibish there. You put it in a pot, somebody else got involved. No good. And they send it, okay, where am I? It's not water that have been drawn, that have another influence, another source. When the water passes through a pipe, and a pipe, of course, is open at both ends, and let me add, it's made of rubber, and we only use a half pipe, we place it against the wall, because we're fanatics. It, it mirrors, it corroborates the mystical process. It's coming from a higher level to a lower level, but never settling it's passing through, but never settling in a vessel. Even though it's not water from a well, 
it's water from rain. But still, rain, when the sends from heaven to the earth, is like the intimacy between a man and a woman. It's the time of intimacy from the Abishta with the world. That comes through the so-called pipes of heaven. That are pure. When the water goes into a vessel, there's another influence. In other words, the Rebbe hated to use an umbrella. The Rebbe used to say, rain is a blessing. You want to obstruct it. So it's okay, so don't so carry an umbrella, go home, and get into a pool of water. No, 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 no. You want the water to come straight from the heaven unto you. And that's the idea of not using my Shuvah. This is what the, the Kanti says. This is sufficient. Huh? Never use an umbrella. Never, never. The Rebbe once told a woman who wasn't even through, she shouldn't use an umbrella because it's a blessing. The rain should fall on her. The Rebbe had this Mishagaz. He didn't use an umbrella, and if he would have had it his way, none of us would have used umbrellas. It's very good for the hat business, you know. The guy in Kingston, what's his name? Primo. Primo, Primo. He's very into not using umbrellas. Uh, it's good for, for the shed company. For the shed company, for sure. The shed company, they, they actually negotiate with the Abish that it should rain. Also, you know, it's not because I thought it polyester. Okay, enough. Then he mentions Chatzitza. He says, because the Tzadah Kol Gufashi, Elaban, the whole body has to go with it. So, so he adds here, yeah, before we spoke about the idea of water, inclusiveness is purity. It's such an interesting idea. Not using a vessel means you're getting it straight from heaven. Nobody else is interfering. The, then here he brings the 40 measures of water. We're going to leave it alone. Enough, enough. Turn the page. Turn the page. Now we get to the Alter Rebbe. This one. Kufnun Zayin. There we are. This page. This is when Alter Rebbe said it is the famous Kavanah Samikra. This is one of those cases where the Alter Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tev, made kavanas that are inconsistent with Arizal. The kavanas of Mikveh and the kavanas of Shoifer. This is Alter Rebbe. Is the Alter Rebbe goes against the Arizal. The Baal Shem I told you a few times, that the Alter Rebbe Baal Shem Tev was sitting by his table, and he was teaching his Talmud in the kavanas of Mikveh or the kavanas of Shoifer, or both. And the Talmud started to think, hey, it says Arizal different. Of course, nobody said a word to the Holy Baal Shem Tev, but they were thinking it. Of course, the Baal Shem didn't say a word to them. But he knew it. But the youngest Talmud at the table, Rabbi Nachum, Mehadanka, fell asleep. Rabbi Nachum Mehadanka was a Tzadik Gomer. A Tzadik Gomer says to himself, stay awake. He stays awake. And he can't keep his eyes open. His eyes are like lead. And he falls asleep. And he sees heaven. And all the Nishamas are running. He says, where are you running? Where are you running? And he saw Baal Shem Tev is going to say to him. So he runs also. He comes to a huge hall full of Nishamas. And he gets himself a good spot. And the Hashem gets up and says the exact same title that he just heard before he fell asleep. About Kavanas HaMikveh and Kavanas HaTkiyas. There's two places where the Hashem has different Kavanas. So a young man gets up with a black beard and starts arguing with the Hashem Tev. And the Hashem argues back. They argue, 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 argue. And the young man with the black beard says, you're correct. And Nachmadenka wakes up. And the Hashem turns to Nachmadenka and says, no, so who's right? <laughs> no, so who's right? <laughs> it's got everything in it. <laughs> the Nachman, the grandfather of Nachman Breslov, the Nachman Merdank. There's a whole part of this, still part of that story of how he gets there in the first place. Yeah. In any case, the Kvech that the Alter Rebbe adds here, which we didn't have in the Rikanti, is that he doesn't say that waters are co- a unity, he says waters are the source of pleasure. And the whole idea of mikveh is that you put yourself into an environment of pleasure and it repels pain. There's a very interesting marshal here. It goes into a whole marshal. He says, basically, if you're a very, very fine person, you can't suffer somebody else's pain. Not only can't you suffer your own, you can suffer somebody else's. If you're a man who's poor, you can tolerate somebody else's poverty. But when you're rich and you watch poverty by somebody else, this is written here clearly, you can't take it. And the more f- rich you are, the less you can tolerate somebody else's poverty. When you see somebody else's poverty, you have to get rid of it. So he says, Mayim is Tainuk, pleasure. It's a very high source. And the idea of Mayim is Tainuk is very similar to what I said before. The Tezantanya, chapter 1, Mayim Matzmichim, called what is the source of all pleasures? Because what is the experience of pleasure? Immersion. When you experience a pleasure, you get lost in it. Just like water has this characteristic, of bringing things together, right? What does pleasure do to the person? It, it makes you weak. Of, uh, it makes you weak. 
It makes you weak. Right? In Tanakh, there's a story about a person who wanted to kill somebody else. So they gave him a lot of pleasure. And then killed him. Because pleasure weakens you. Pain empowers you. Pain focuses you. Pleasure weakens you. You're lost in it. That's why Hasidah says pleasure and will are a cause and effect and a dichotomy. The pleasure motivates the will, but the pleasure offsets the will because will is urgency, will is power, will is anger, will is determination. Pleasure is euphoria. So the pleasure motivates the will or the will culminates in pleasure, but when you go from one to the next, you cancel out the other. When you wanted something and you got it, you can't imagine how you did it because the moment you acquired it, you're weak because pleasure envelops you. The urge turns off the circuit, right? Pleasure embraces you. And one of the things that happens when you're embraced by pleasure is you can't tolerate pain. When you're out there working and you hit your head, you're like a worker. You used to be before you became a big businessman. And you have other people working. You slam your finger with a hammer. Big deal. Right? But if you're Yeshiva Bachar, who slams his finger with a hammer, oh, it's not because you're... When you're in that world, you don't feel the pain the same way. When you're a mufunak, when you're a mu'unig, you, you, you can't tolerate the pain. It says Hasidus, immersion in water means immersing yourself in spiritual pleasures. It pushes away pain. It pushes away tumah. It can't tolerate things that are not spiritually clean. So here, the water is not representative of dilution. It's embracing. It's, making, it's bringing you in. And bringing you in, not just making your bad less because there is so much good around. It's pushing the bad out. In other words, the difference between what the Alter Rebbe is saying and what the Rekanti is saying, in my view, is that Rekanti is simply saying that water dilutes the Tumah. It doesn't get rid of it. Which is called Hamtakas HaGavurus Bachasadim in Ayin Beis Chayel Gimel. The sweeping of strength with kindness. This is called Ein HaGavurus Nimtakas HaGavurus Bisharsha. Chesed is kindness. Tainug Pleasure is actually Gavur. It says in Hasidus, honey comes from Gavur, not from Chesed. Einag, you want to sweeten Gavur, it's for real. You have to have a source of Gavur. When you sweeten Gavur with Chesedim, you're diluting them. And it seems to me that that's the Rekanti's position. The Alter Rebbe says, waters are getting rid of Tumba. It's not, it's diluting the Tumba. It's such a powerful goodness, it expels it. It can't stand it. It pushes it out. In other words, you're immersing yourself in an experience of pleasure from godliness. Anything that's not good, it just it's thrown up. It just, it's, you know, it's like you're in a very good environment and you eat some bad fish, you throw it up. It just doesn't work. The, the, the goodness is so overwhelming, it gets it out of the system. So it seems to me that this is deeper than the Rikanti. Because this is not making the Gavura less it's pushing it out. The goodness is of such a quality, it just exposes, it dispels the evil. I don't have time to read this. What is the essential difference between the Arizal and the Balsam? Oh, I have no idea. It's Kavonis, it's Shemis. I started to look it up and I said, I'll save it. I'll leave it for you. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's. Now, then on the next page, page 318, there's more stuff. He speaks about Memsaw on the right side of the page. And at the top of the left side of this page, he speaks about Mayim Shu'uzim. But I'm going to skip it all. Okay? Then you have a Samach Vov. I'm skipping this too. This is homework. I, I just want to get you... You know what? The rest of this book, you have more Alta Rebbe, Rebbe Rashad from Samach Vov, and the Rebbe. There, I just want to say two things about what the Rebbe speaks about Mikveh, which we haven't yet spoken about. The first is the classic notion. I printed over here three or four Sikhs. I would like to make special mention of the last one. I would like to encourage everybody to get a chance to read the last page. Page 108. 108, 109, and 110. And maybe I'll even touch on it. But there are simple, I want to just add two more points. The first point is that the Hebrew word tvila is Isis habitl. The Hebrew word tvila, immersion, means to become nullified. Surrounding yourself by water means losing yourself. Surrendering yourself. In other words, so far, we've talked about the effect of the water on you. Now we're talking about the effect of you putting yourself in the water. Putting yourself in the water means you're surrendering. Bittle. I'm unclean. My uncleanness is rooted in what? In my separateness from Hashem, my weakness, my ego. The immersion in water, being, allowing yourself to, be, to surrender to the water, 
In other words, surrendering to the Eibishter, who is the source of that water, who is the water is representative of, takes away the ego, takes away the ego, the impurity that was able to touch or, or draw from you has been eliminated. It's a different idea. It's not the same. It's not dilution. It's not called Amtokas Achsadim Magvudas. It's not repelling the Gavuda because of her. the two ideas I mentioned before. It's a whole, because now it's not about the water affecting you, it's about you allowing yourself to enter the water. And the last point is the most fascinating point of all. And that is what the Gemara says in Chulin, Ike Trilusa Benur. Real Trila is in fire, not in water. That's everything we just said about fire, water. And everything terrible that Akanti said about water, fire. about fire, the Gemara says, and I'll give you bikits and imnets. The halacha says that you type of something in water, you purify it. But there are certain things that can never be made pure. An earthenware vessel becomes tame, you have to break it. Can't, there's no such thing as purifying an earthenware vessel. cannot be. Just like in Isra you never get the taste out of an earthenware vessel. You can never get the tum out of an earthenware vessel. Why? It's a very complicated issue. It's a very, very complicated issue. Absorbs. But, it, okay, that absorbs taste, fine, but spirituality, why is an earthenware vessel any worse than a vessel made of glass or made of metal? And the irony is, a vessel made of stone can never become tummy. Never. Never. A vessel made of earth, but it wasn't baked in a, in a potter's furnace, can never become tummy. A vessel made of glolim, What's the fancy word for glolim? The nice, the edel word. Uh, dung. Can never become tummy. Never. And an earthly way vessel, it's virtually the same material, but it's baked in an oven to prepare it for use. Once it becomes tummy, there's no tahad. I, I have a theory about it. I have a theory about it. Um, and it has to do with the fact that earth, earthenware is a cheap material. And because it's a cheap material, the only reason for its existence is for its usefulness. In other words, when you make a vessel out of gold, if it's not a vessel, it's gold. When you make an earth and a vessel, a vessel out of earth, if it's not a vessel, it's nothing. Yes. Its entire identity is its usefulness. In Lashon Hasidus, it's a tzura. It's what it is, what, it, what its purpose is. If you take away the purpose of an earth and a vessel, there's no vessel. You take away the purpose from a golden vessel, it's gold or silver. Even glass. Has a, you can use it for different things. To scrape. Right? Glass has different uses. Um, therefore, since an earthenware vessel is only its usefulness, usefulness is not a thing. It's, usefulness is an idea. So you can't fix that. You, you cannot correct something spiritual. When you're tabling a golden vessel in a mikveh, because it became tame, you're tabling the gold. When you're tabling an earthenware vessel, you're tabling it's the reciprocal, its ability to hold. The earth is nothing. The reciprocal is also nothing. So there can't be any tad, with one exception. Put the earthenware vessel back into the oven that you made it in the first place. Heat up the furnace to the same temperature that you heated up the first time. You can purify it. You know why? Because the old vessel is gone. This is a new one. So the Gemara says that when you're purifying something by tabling it in water even though the Chinuch told us that the notion is renewal the renewal is only affecting it to some extent and in, if my interpretation is correct you're renewing the matter of the vessel not the idea of the vessel when you take that vessel put it into an oven you don't have to table it, you don't have to fix it what was tummy is dead what now exists is brand new it never existed before that's why when a person dies, we off the table in the river of fire. The table in the river of fire nowadays ain't such a good idea, right? Not mathematically, not psych- psychologically or psychosomatically, nor physiologically, physiologically nor audiologically with a T. Um, <laughs> when, when the Shabbat dies, you have to table in the middle of fire because water renews but on to some extent. Fire is, makes a completely new material. So the Rebbe says, what's the nimshal of fire? The Rebbe says, he explains, what's the idea of fire? 
What's the idea of fire? The Rebbe says fire is Mesir Nefesh. And there's a lot of details in the Rebbe Sichas. But one of the things he says is, one person goes into fire. The thing is, the thing is when you're tabled in a mikveh, you don't become pure until you emerge from the mikveh. It's one of those weird halachas. But the halacha that you become pure when you emerge from the mikveh doesn't require you to emerge completely. You poked your pinky out of the mikveh, you're pure. So the Rebbe says, one yid, one yid, tables in fire. One yid goes on the Sinas Nefesh. It's like the pinky of Klai Yisrael going into the water and emerging. The whole Klai Yisrael has been purged. The whole Klai Yisrael. He says, one yid in Russia, gate of Mesir Nefesh. The whole Klai Yisrael is brand new.